Welcome to the Music and Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Williams Birch, and this is episode 71, the second of our two episodes with Dr. Matt Hill. Last week in episode 70, you learned all about Dr. Hill's community organization, Sing Omaha. If you don't already know who Matt Hill is, or if you haven't listened to that episode, jump back and at least listen to the beginning so you can hear all about the story of how Dr. Hill got into choir and the world of music education. In today's episode, a repertoire exploration episode, Dr. Hill walks us through the music that he has selected for his programs at Sing Omaha. Not only are you going to get a plethora of titles and composers, you'll hear how Dr. Hill programs to ensure that there aren't too many fast or slow or middle of the road pieces and how he ensures that his singers and his organizations are growing together as a community, that they have wonderful, meaningful text and excellent opportunities for specific music education and vocal technique growth. This was a fun one to hear about, and I spent a ton of time after this recording going down the rabbit hole of listening to all the songs he picked out. Without further ado, this episode is brought to you by the friends over at KCC. I almost forgot. <laughs> the Guinness and Coral Company. You can check that out at emilyburch.org slash sponsors. I was so excited about the music. <laughs> You should click on their logo and check out all the awesome tracks they have to help you get started with some of your repertoire planning. Now, without further ado, episode 71, a repertoire exploration episode with our friend, artistic director and founder of the Sing Omaha program, Dr. Matt Hill. Welcome to episode 71 of the Music Ed Matters podcast, where we're welcoming back Dr. Matt Hill. What's up, Dr. Hill? Hey, hey, hey. hey. <laughs> How are you? I'm so good. If you did not listen to episode 70, go jump back and at least listen to the beginning. I mean, listen to the whole thing because it's amazing. But you'll get to know Dr. Hill and where he came from. But today, we're talking about repertoire. Can't wait. It's my favorite thing. It's the lifeblood of what we do. It is. It is our curriculum. It's our everything. It's our connective tissue. Tell us about what choirs are you programming for right now? Yeah, so I get to direct... um, a women's choir and a mixed choir at a state college here, Peru State College, where I'm director of choral studies. So those are non-auditioned groups. And those students come primarily from rural schools. So I'm doing a lot of fundamental work, um, particularly with freshmen. So I'm always thinking about um, diversity in style, ensuring that over a four year period, my music ed students are going to be exposed to music from all style periods that they get to perform with different instrumental consorts. Uh, and that's right from, from earliest two part, uh, you know, single line chant, two part music, four part, um, uh, it's maybe antiphonal things to contemporary pop and rock music. I think they need to see it all. So uh, as I'm thinking about repertoire over a given season, I'm thinking about accessibility. I'm thinking about relatability, things that they're going to just love. Um, and then at Sing Omaha, I direct adult ensembles, a mixed group. The Sing Omaha Master Chorale is auditioned. The Sing Omaha Women's Choir is adult women to audition. And the Sing Omaha Girls Choir is seventh through 12th grade, predominantly eighth, ninth, and 10th grade singers. Um, and so there I'm thinking a little differently because the, the marketability of that repertoire for the singers and for the audience is a little different uh, in that I have to be able to sell tickets. I need you know, I like themed concerts at the community choir level because it's easy to sell the audience and the singers on a through line idea when there are multiple ensembles on stage who sort of need to be tied together. Uh, I'm not opposed to what I call a potpourri concert, which is just a nice concert of choral music. That's great, but um, it's a little harder to market. Um, It's a little harder to get buy in. So at that level, I'm thinking about, particularly with the middle school, high school students, the kinds of music that they're doing in school, and then maybe the kinds of things that they don't get to do. So the single gender thing is already differentiating us from what most middle school and high school students are doing. Uh, So that's great. And I just, I love treble music so much. There's so much incredible repertoire out there uh, that never gets performed, it doesn't seem. And while I love to hear my trebles sing about flowers and boys and sunrises and things, it's not exclusively 
uh, what they're interested in, and it's not exclusively what's out there. So you've got to go and do some digging. But um, so I'm trying to find things that are off the beaten path, trying to find things that would allow me to bring in professional instrumentalists, which they don't generally get to perform with in their schools. And we've got great relationships here in town with union players who are more than happy to come in and collaborate with us. So um, there are a lot of factors, as you know, and as we all know, things that play in when if I have a really strong tenor section, then I can be thinking about Debussy. And if I don't, then maybe that's not a road I'm walking down this year. So um, so is that where you start? Do you start with where are your singers and what do they need? Is that what's your starting point? I think so. Let's start with Sing Omaha. The, the starting point for me generally there is where do I perceive there to be opportunities for the ensembles to grow based on what I know I have in terms of returning membership, what I think I'm going to be able to recruit. Um, and so I don't, I don't love starting a year in a community organization sort of in neutral, right? I want to dive into substantive rep. And that doesn't necessarily mean that it's multi divisi and all in Russian, right? Um, but the trying to find, you know, casting a wide net and finding as many different colors as I can put onto a program is, is where I try to start because something in that rep is going to speak to everyone in the room. Um, and I guess the other thing is I try to think about music that's one degree higher than where I think they're going to be from a difficulty standpoint, because I want them to feel like they're here for a reason and they need to work for it. And as we've all experienced, they will, they will achieve that thing that they didn't think they could, which then motivates the rest of the season. At Peru State, I'm thinking about stylistic diversity. I wanna make sure that we've got um, something from the classical period. I wanna make sure we've got something from the early 20th century. I try to make sure I've got a mix of languages I generally don't do much a cappella music in the fall semester because we're an open enrollment school at Peru State. I don't always know what I have coming into my ensembles in the fall. So it's really, I, I over program for the ensembles at Peru State in the fall, trying to, to have a few pieces that I call just add water, right? Which are easy, quick learn, sometimes rote taught things. Um, some that I think will be at their difficulty level early, you know, really great high school rep, uh, sort of uh, small college rep that I think is accessible and appropriate. And then a couple things that if they surprise me that I can throw their way in week two or three that will challenge them. Um, so I, there's a different kind of community need there too, because I'm thinking about upperclassmen music majors who want to be challenged and who you know aren't interested in what they would consider to be introductory literature. I'm thinking about freshman and sophomore music ed majors who are serious about music but maybe don't have the skills required to do some of the other things. And then the, the lifeblood of those choirs for me is the non-music major and they generally come from choral experiences in their high school. Very rarely do they come to choir having not been in choir before, although that happens. But they are they want to come in and have fun. They want to sing in four parts or more, but they don't always have the, the breadth of knowledge about what's possible and they don't always have the skills necessary to immediately jump in. So given the breadth of experience in those groups, I'm, tr I'm just trying to strike a balance that's going to meet everyone's needs, satisfy everyone uh, while ticking some curricular boxes for me as well. So it really starts with knowing the people mm -hmm. and knowing the goal. So much like what we talked about in episode 70, having that mission statement at the center is how you start the organization. You have your mission, your goal, and the people at the heart of your repertoire selection. Yeah, I think that's beautifully stated. It's what we do, isn't it? It's all people. Mm -hmm. It's all it's relationships. It's all people. It's all people. Okay, so now tell us a little bit about what music you've selected for this year and why you've picked it. Give us some oh repertoire exploration time, please. Let me grab my older. So some of this yes. is carryover from pre-COVID things that I selected and wanted to do. Um, so I'm, this is exclusively Sing Omaha we're going to talk about, okay, because okay. Uh, my packet of stuff for Peru State is like three inches thick and I'm just going to have them read things and we're going to try stuff out. See, so, okay. but here I have a pretty good idea about what we're going to try to get done. And the other thing to say is I don't know what things are like for you guys COVID wise where you are, but for us, I'm planning for but not banking on a full concert season where we're going to be performing in venues with audiences. I just don't know that that's going to be a thing. So I'm trying to program things that I think would be great on the concert stage, but that would also be great to record so that in the, I mean, I'll record either way, but things that would be exciting for the singers, but great for YouTube 
Uh, some things have been recorded before and others perhaps not, but rep that I think I can sink my teeth into and that I can buy into, which makes it a heck of a lot easier for me to sell it to my singers. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a huge piece right there. Like so often me. you program something for another reason, but you have to love, like I'm so excited for rehearsal because I can't wait to dive into this music. And I always joke, I have enough excitement to get you into it. And then you'll join me on that level eventually. Right. And if we don't have that, Right. There are times when we've gone to festivals and so there's been sort of festival music mm -hmm. and you've, you've got to find a way to relate to it. And so mm -hmm. I always encourage my singers, find a chord, right? Find one little melodic idea, find something that you love about this. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's the double bar line at the end of the piece, right? That's your goal. That's where we're headed. You've got to find something to love. So because we have to give this an authentic performance. So right. um, that's our goal together. That's so true. Yep. All okay, right. Tell us about your music. I'm excited okay, to hear. So this, it's like, it's a little bit scattershot as I look at it, but I really am excited to get going. Uh, Elaine Hagerberg's Song of Miriam, mm -hmm. which if you don't know, is just like butter. I am so excited to hear my women sing this. Um, Why did you pick it? I, I like lyrical music, um, particularly early on in a season with trebles because Uniformity of tone color is critical for all of us, right? We're always trying to find uniform vowels and moments where the sonority and the timbre align so that we're not thinking about tuning, we're not thinking about uh, pronunciation, us trying to achieve this sonic goosebumps moment, right? And so beyond the fact that she, Elaine Hagenberg, is just writing lovely music and is a part of what I think is a choral renaissance in the United States right now. Uh, this provides us an opportunity to sing in three parts with some crunchy chord moments, which everybody loves, right? That's our music. That's our style. Thank you, Eric Whitaker at all for that over the last 20 years. Um, and, the, and the lyric is substantive. I can feel comfortable asking my adults to emotionally and intellectually invest into this piece. And so early on in the rehearsal process with them, um, you know, I don't like to give, I, I guess maybe this is on me a bad thing, but I don't like to feed my choirs candy music. You know what I mean? It's just, it doesn't all have to be stuffy. That's not what I want, but I want there to be something substantive. And sometimes that's harmonic language. And sometimes it's intervallic leaps that we have to try to achieve together. And it's not so much that they can't hear it, but how do we do that beautifully? How do I transition from chest voice up into head voice on a vowel that doesn't feel great in head voice? And so it's this the idea that a choral rehearsal is a corporate voice lesson has always been really attractive to me. And my applied teaching absolutely informs what I'm doing on the podium and vice versa. So I just love the mechanics of that. So finding music that allows us to talk about tone production and phonation and modification, uh, that's where I get to be sort of nerdy and, and geek out. It. It. So, yeah, I think fun. it's so good. We always talk about that, the collab, like the large group voice lesson as a place to really develop and see, okay, yes, I'm interested in pursuing private voice lessons, but it starts as you're going through that voice change for the for the treble voices at least. Yep. Is this something that can help me navigate and explore sounds? And then, okay, I wanna focus and get specific help. I always tell parents, it helps you get the bigger bang for your buck when it's time for the private voice lessons. No question, no question. And and for people who are singing in a choir and taking applied, they get that regular opportunity to practice what they've been doing in their lesson in a maybe more practical environment where they're hearing other voices around them, some of which might be good to model and others of which might not be. So having to hold your own um, and then being able to employ your personal technique particularly through passaggio as you're thinking about vowel modification while trying to maintain pronunciation, if that's necessary. In some cases, sopranos don't need to, right? If they're singing Gs and As and Bs above the staff, a beautiful open O vowel is sufficient because alto tenors and basses are gonna be carrying that text largely. So you don't, you can sacrifice pronunciation in favor of beautiful tone, creating a canopy over the top of the choir of sopranos. As, as you go, so go the rest of us. And uh, so please sing beautifully up there, right? Singing an E vowel on a high A is not always pretty. So let's do something different. Um, so right, educating the, and then learning in their own individual voices what it takes to achieve that beautiful ensemble sound. Mm -hmm. uh, I love to watch those sort of light bulb moments in individual singers. I love it. So what comes after Song of Miriam? I'm just going through my, this is, please, this is not concert order, okay? Okay, this, not concert order. It's very important please, to know. Please, because I this is not work. concert order. Okay, Thank I got you it. so much. <laughs> uh, Jacob Narud Adastra. 
Oh. Love this thing. Again, this is this is a. Um, I, so when I program visually in my Excel spreadsheet, I color code like a stoplight. So red is slow or sort of down or mournful. Yellow is medium, just sort of average feel. And green is either intense or up-tempo or exciting, right? So I do that because I wanna make sure from a visual standpoint that I have something I can see that each ensemble has a variety, but that also over the course of, an, of, a, of a concert where I've got four ensembles singing, that there's variety for the audience. It's like you're going on a commute. That's You're right. Driving through your concert. <laughs> right. I try to do that. Slow down, speed up, stop, right? Hold off. Please. Um, so too many reds in a row, your audience is gonna fall asleep, right? Um, too many uh, reds in a row. Red lights. Uh, for, like, listen, I have a 60-minute commute one way to school every day. So I am uh I try to like time things, but I have no idea what I'm doing in terms of stoplights. So we just follow the law and do our best. Um <laughs> In the choral world, it's sort of the same thing, right? Like mm -hmm. we want a mix. I'm, I am in love with this neo-romantic, ooey gooey, gorgeous, please just sing to me, right? But it, I can't program full concerts of that. So, right. um, so it, it gives me a visual cue. So this, this Ad Astra is a yellow for me. So it's, it's Lilty 6-8. Um, it is on the way to head voice. So it's, it's high mix. For the trebles, uh, it's on its way to head voice modification, which gives this really, I think, resonant uh, hot air balloon canopy of sound where the weight is on top. Mm. Uh, so everything is ringing out. And he has achieved, I think, such mastery in unison line here so that okay. singers have an opportunity. I don't, I, unison singing, I think, is the hardest singing. So hard. It's so hard because everything has to be lined up. Vowel pronunciation, dynamic, placement of consonants, right? Anybody can sing in three and four and five parts when it's just a stacked chord and it's, you know, it feels a little loosey to me. But unison singing is, it forces us to be aware of everything that's happening around us and of every sound that we're producing. So uh, from a teaching perspective, I love this early on because as we're assimilating new members into our sound, um, and I have a very specific treble sound that I'm after, and my returning singers know that, and they're generally able to produce it. I hope that's true after a year and a half off. But you know. It'll be there. Yes, I hope so. I appreciate your encouragement. We'll find out at seven o'clock tonight. Uh, um, I'll, I'll let you know. Mine's happening at 4.30. Oh my awesome. gosh. Okay. Well, the, I'm going to send you a message after our rehearsal okay. tonight. Okay. Deal. Okay. I hope it's wonderful for you. Uh, so I love this piece. It, it should be a quick learn. That's one of the reasons that I programmed it. I just want it to be something that they can make music on right away because they need that feeling, right? I'm also now thinking about the fact that we haven't had real choir since February of 2020. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they're they going to be apprehensive. They're going to be emotional, right? I'm already getting uh, tearful messages. I can't wait to be back. Somebody saw me sitting at this desk two weeks ago, pulled up in front of the studio. They had been to the restaurant right down the plaza and came in with tears in her eyes and just gave me a hug and said, I can't wait to be back. I think that that sentiment is gonna be true in all of our choirs. So um, this will be what we start with tonight so that they can be successful right away. So I'm excited about that. Kevin Memley, Dreamland. If you guys don't know Kevin Memley, oh my gosh, he writes some of the most beautiful music. I can't get enough of what he's writing. Uh, and this is lovely. It's Christina Rossetti poetry, right? So again, pretty mm -hmm. quick to relate to. Um, this is a yellow to red. It's sort of orangey for me. Um, 60 beats a minute. It's expressive. It provides these big dynamic swell moments where we're thinking about, so this is a control teaching issue, right? How do we maintain the vowel and pace a crescendo and a decrescendo? Mm -hmm without compromising the, the color of the tone? How do we yes. maintain timbre as our focal point while allowing for a blossom and then a decay in the phrase? Uh, this gives us wonderful opportunities to do that. So Kevin Memley, M-E-M-L-E-Y. Oh my gosh, he is really masterful. He's a high school choir pianist, I think in California. Okay. Has not conducted, but some of the most beautiful music I programmed in the last four or five years has come from his catalog. So awesome. Thanks for the rec. Check out Kevin Mimley. Bob Chilcott's Evening Hymn. Mm -hmm. This is just lovely. I, I know you guys know Bob Chilcott. There aren't very many melody writers like, like Bob, and this is just lovely. Um, poetry that I didn't know, but that I sort of have 
uh, related with here, now that the sun hath veiled his light and bid the world good night to the soft, soft bed, my body I dispose mm. before the ending of the day. It's this, it's sort of, I don't know, it feels formal to me. It feels like a movie that I would be watching. So I like the, I like the British pronunciation. I like the, his harmonic language is always beautiful. This is SSAA. Um, what but color is it? Though. In your, in your. Repertoire. This is another sort of orangey one because it starts. So he says expressive quarter notes circa 76, but there are uh, key change moments and big dynamic swell moments. So it's moving within this. I wouldn't call it pure red because it doesn't live in that world all the time. So there are moments of espressivo in terms both of timbre and in dynamic expression while we're singing in English, which I think sometimes we take for granted both as conductors and singers, at least in America, because we see these words and we know how to pronounce them and we don't give the diction as much attention as we would if we were singing in German or French or Italian or Spanish or something. And so I always encourage my singers to think about a non-English singer speaker being in the audience how would we pronounce that if we knew that they were listening? And so these, these moments of sort of ooey gooey lovely are also juxtaposed with trying to communicate text, which is what I assume Bob Chilcott was thinking about when he wrote the thing, right? So it's always going back to text for me, whether it's scripture or poetry or prose or you know single line chant, what does alleluia mean? Why are we repeating this over and over again? What's its purpose? And so asking people to make those decisions on their own about why they would relate to it and why that repetition would exist is always interesting. And then I try not to let it devolve into 20 minutes of conversation, but I'm always interested in singer feedback, right? What does this mean to you? And then other people will jump on and go, oh my gosh, I never thought about it that way, but yes, totally. The best so, conversations. I love that. They're so much smarter than we are. I mean, I, I don't want to speak for you or anybody else. My singers are so much smarter than me. I learn so much more from them than I'm able to teach them. So I just, I love being in rehearsal because I go, oh my gosh, what a beautiful analogy. What a beautiful image you just painted for us. I'm totally stealing it on a sticky note. I'm going to use it the next time. So. I love what their insights, especially the young people right now that are coming through this, co the, we did a book study. Like we did a, I wanted to spend more time with them. So we read a book and did a book club. And cool. the insight, like, I'm coming, I'm like, wow, I've never read a book like this. And this one girl goes, that's because of the generation that you're in. <laughs> okay. I will learn from you. Awesome. <laughs> They're beautiful souls. I love that the music that you've talked about so far, you're offering a variety of your color and your red, yellow, and green color scheme. You're talking about the text, and there's always a musical reason for doing every single piece that you've selected. Um, you've talked a lot about oranges and yellows. I would love to hear a green and a red. Yes. So again, another Narvarud, and I didn't do this on purpose, but O Quam Gloriosum mm. for trebles. This is a green. It moves. I'm probably going to go a little faster than his called for tempo. Sorry, Jacob. Um, mm. But I want it to be exciting. Uh, it's It's got some crunchy harmony moments. There are time signature changes everywhere. So initially just teaching those rhythmic patterns to singers so that they feel comfortable in the structure is going to be excited. He's He's got um, some flowy moments here where we're singing in two parts. I'm just going through the scores. I'm looking here. Um, but it's so it's an ABA experience where the A on the bookends is sort of in your face and go. So I'm excited about that. The Mendelssohn Hexen lead, uh, which I hope we've all done is lovely. And they loved uh, Witches Chorus a few years back, we did the Verdi and I've actually done that two or three times with them. Um, so this is something different, but in a similar vein. Uh, so I'm excited to get going on that. My pianist is wonderful and lovely and I gave this to her early so that she would be ready to go tonight because there's Very a little bit of you. work to be done here. So. Yes. Um, so I'm excited about getting that going. That's a green. And now I'm to mixed. Oh, so, okay. So we've gone through treble. What's in mixed? Jonathan Reed's Measure Me Sky. This was a 2020 publication that then didn't probably get programmed as much as it would have had we all had a regular season. I love this text. I've done Mulholland's setting of this for trebles a couple of times and it's wonderful. Um, this is one of those set the tone color kinds of experiences. Um, it's a back and forth between tenor basses and trebles, which I think is really exciting. There are, again, some unison line opportunities here where we get to experience 
art song type singing and interpretation mm -hmm. in a choral setting, which again, I love early on in a rehearsal process. Um, but for me, it's text. It's two against three in the keyboard. It's got this sort of flowing, um, flying kind of a feeling, which is always exciting, I think, for, for the singers to get to feel like they're not doing a whole lot of work, but the, the piece is raw looking and moving forward uh, in a steady way. So, but, but for me, it's poetry. I love this. And if you don't know this Jonathan Reed setting, go find it for your mixed groups. Totally accessible for high school, I think. Great for the community. I'm, I may end up doing it at Peru State as well. So love that. Ola Yelo's The Rose. Yes, that's a classic. Beautiful. Yep, he does great work. And this is not one that I've uh, programmed before, so I'm excited to dive in there. With strings, I love different color on a program. So we've got a uh, string quartet going to play with us for our October concert, uh, provided that we have one. Uh, acapella, more motet style. Uh, contemporary, this is 2015 by Nick Myers. Jenny, hmm. I don't know if you know this piece. Mm -mm. Um, it's a sort of an in memoriam poem, it sounds like, to someone who was loved and who they lost. Uh, my wife's name is Jen, and so I was initially attracted to this having heard a high school group perform it at our state festival. Um, it's, it is SATB, no Devisi, lovely harm. I, I lied a little bit of Devisi, sorry, measure 22. Um, but totally accessible, all triadic stuff. Um, this is a red gooey, lovely, sort of make it happen. Arneson's flight song, which I love and have not done and needed to do. Again, yeah. particularly with tenor basses, big, beautiful melody to open. Um, and something that I think they could record. And then here's your big green for the mixed. Uh, Invictus by Joshua Rist, mm -hmm. which I uh, heard uh, Dr. Zilke record at um, Oregon State and just fell in love with, oh my gosh, this thing is a burn from start to finish. And something semi-challenging that we're gonna take a few weeks to have to get off the ground. The thing that I love about working with these adult choirs at Sing Omaha is that there's very little that has to happen to get things up and running. Uh, so two, three rehearsals in and most everything in the packet is ready to go, right? We're, we're singing notes and lyrics and rhythms and things. So then it's refinement and interpretation and cleaning and precision. These are, I think, really wonderful examples of what ACDA continues to promote as one of their pillars uh, in promoting lifelong singing, that high quality choral music making doesn't have to stop at the high school or undergrad level. And the traditional community choir in the United States has, I think, in the mid to late 20th century, been more about the social connection than it has been about high level art. And I don't think that those two have to be mutually exclusive. Uh, so what we have done is made it clear in our interview process and in the auditions that the intention here is for this to be an extension of a high quality collegiate experience. And so we're attracting singers who want that, who are willing to put in the time outside, who have the requisite experience necessary to come in and hang, right? Just to be able to, to be in the room uh, without being overwhelmed. And they now are pushing me, right? Let's, let's try something harder. Let's try something, you know, what would it take for us to be, you know, audition successfully for a regional ACDA or a national ACDA? So the goal over the next handful of years here is to be programming music, rehearsing it to a level of proficiency, uh, and then capturing on recording their, their great work. And they've been, I think, regional national quality for a handful of years, the last two or three, they've really elevated themselves, particularly the treble choir. Um, and the thing I love about that is that there aren't very many high level treble choirs, right? I think a mistake that high school directors make is to relegate the treble ensemble to be a JV group. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting to me is what seems to happen there is that the, the really high quality, high caliber, highly skilled, experienced treble singers end up in a room with tenors and basses who are not as experienced. So um, for me, I encourage my high school colleagues who have treble ensembles and mixed to rank their women and then to put the odd numbers in one group and the even numbers in the other. And then if you wanna switch them the next year, you can. But that gives your treble ensemble an even balance of skill and experience, which then opens the door for a broader variety of literature. And I just think treble music deserves to be more than a second fiddle JV ensemble. And so I have to sell that to singers who come to me and audition at Sing Oh, The treble choir is a peer to the mixed ensemble. This is not, a secondary ensemble. And when you hear recordings, you'll understand what I mean. It's possible to have this happen at a really high level. So 
uh, I think the arrow is pointing up. I'm just hopeful that I can continue to be the one to lead them, that I can stay one step ahead of them. Um, but I'm, I just can't wait to dive back into music making. I love that you have shared not just like your music for the semester, but your process. You've talked about the importance of knowing your people and knowing your community and having those musical goals. You had something for each one of those songs to help your singers grow and go to the next level musically, vocally, emotionally, conversationally. That was so fun to hear. And then I love your color coding system. Isn't it fun? It feels it a little fun. elementary to me, but I like... I like the visual. When I zoom out and I see four choirs on a concert, particularly as I'm beginning the, the programming process where I'm just going through stuff that I've heard at conferences or things that I've come across while I'm looking. So I go, I try not to use JW Pepper as my primary uh, search um, tool. I like to go to individual composer websites. I love programming contemporary music. Um, they can use the money, right? Uh, and uh, Mozart, while it's lovely, uh, doesn't. So we should do Mozart, of course. I'm not saying not to. I'm not saying don't do Brahms. I'm not saying don't do Palestrina. I'm saying let's give some consideration to people who are living and writing and breathing our music and our relatable text today. So that's important to me. Uh, sometimes I'll program based on a piece that I want to do. So I want to do this piece. My choir needs to do this. They're going to love it. It's going to be awesome. And so then I try to find things around that piece, either that fit from a text standpoint or that are stylistically a fun match. I don't really buy into, not, not that it's not viable, but I don't relate with or resonate with the idea of key relationships, ending a song in G and then starting in C. I just don't think the audience cares. There's enough of a break between pieces that there's not that connection. So I don't get into that too much, but um, the, the repertoire is how we, how we work. And I think incredible music can make a middle of the road choir sound incredible. Uh, and I think mediocre music can turn a really top-notch ensemble into something that's more middle of the road. And so I, I try to, for me, the process is I want to see a hundred things before I pick the five that I'm going to share with an ensemble. So trying to be as discerning as possible. If people want to hear Sing Omaha, do you have a YouTube channel? Do you have a website? We do. It's fledgling at this point. So we were ready to go. I had an engineer all hired and then COVID happened. So I'm hopeful that as this year goes, that we'll be populating the YouTube channel. So just sing Omaha on YouTube. You can go find some things. Uh, Singomaha.org will get you to either our choir's website or our studio's website if you want to just learn more about the operation there. Um, and then I'm hopeful if you'll follow us on social media, you can check us out on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And we are... Uh, we're ready to launch, right? We've spent the last 15 or 17 months sort of just prepping for what a relaunch is going to look like and feel like. So um, we've got an engineer who's going to come in and do some recording for us for our girls and boys and uh, two adult choirs this year. I hope that that's extra and not in place of concerts, but in the event that we can't concertize, I think it's something uh, that we can work toward and look forward to. It's a culminating experience and something tangible that my singers can take away. Uh, and then again, one of the purposes there is to get really great audition material together so that we can hopefully, you know, get uh, get some opportunities to share with regional and national folks. We performed on state conferences in Nebraska, you know, five times, I think, in the last 10 or 12 years. And so we love performing for our colleagues in Nebraska, but, um, but these groups are ready to take the next step. So that's kind of where we're Yay. planning. Where we're headed. I can't wait to see them on stage. I mean, we'll never be at the same regional conference because I'm so far south and you're so far north, but hopefully on a national stage at some point. Wouldn't it be so fun? I can't wait to hear about more about your Rise Ensemble too. I'm, we need to check in after rehearsals tonight and yes. I, I'm excited about your the growth of that ensemble and the plans yeah, that you might have, have to move forward. So. Yeah, this was such a great, I'm so happy for these two conversations. I'm so appreciative of you sharing not just your story, but your whole musical process. I think there's been so much that you've shared in both episode 70 and this 171 that listeners are going to walk away with. So thank you for sharing you, Dr. Hill. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been great to get to know you and uh, to have some conversation this morning. Thanks again so much for having me. I hope that you had so much fun learning from Dr. Hill's repertoire exploration episode. Go listen to some of those tracks and go think about ways that you too can pick music, not just based on the old checklists, but on the community and the people that are in front of you. I know you're already doing that because you matter and you're doing things that matter. We all know that music matters, especially the music we pick for our ensembles to perform. And I will see you next time on the Music It Matters podcast.